Good evening. Let's uh, begin with a scripture reading, and then we'll go into some prayer time. I'm reading from uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, and uh, this will be in verse 16. Let the word of the Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and with hymns and spiritual songs, singing and thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let's pray. Great and merciful God, we come to you this evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And as we do that, we see the throne room doors to your palace opening up. And there you are, you're listening to us at this time. And this evening, as we begin this time, we have brought forward to you many needs. People that have physical issues, issues of separation, anxiety, financial, relational. And as the great healer, we ask that you step into those circumstances, allowing us to stand in the gap for those people, for healing, for drawing them closer to you, closer to each other. And Father, we thank you for the ability to come to you, for the openness for you to hear us at this time. We graciously thank you, for it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Uh, this is uh, the story of Christianity Part 2, and for those of you that weren't here last week, uh, I am uh, Philip Phil Lilly, uh, and uh, my wife and I go to the uh, Saudi Daisy campus. Um, we have something for you. If you didn't get a three-ring binder and you'd like a little folder to put some of your handouts in, uh, they will be available in the back. There's a box back there where you can pick these up. Uh, I know that a couple of you did get uh, three ring binders, which is great. Uh, it will uh, make it easier for you to kind of hang on to this uh, lesson. And uh, this evening we are going to, okay, there we go. If you would uh, take up your handout, and uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, I would just ask for you to sign in so we have an idea how many folks we had. Uh, we were just short of 40 folks here last week, which is a real praise. Thank you for coming back uh, to see what was up next. Uh, we will be working uh, from your handout this evening. Uh, they'll be following along with the uh, PowerPoints uh, this evening. And the time period that we're going to be looking at is the beginning of the church or so to speak, the beginning of Christianity, however you want to couch those terms. Uh, we'll be going through the time approximately 33 AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, uh, on to about 100 uh, AD. Uh, probably next week I will no longer be using the AD, BC uh, type of uh, uh, designation because we'll be moving into the second and third centuries of the uh, common era or AD as I just mentioned. But if you would look at uh, your handout and uh, the, the first question that comes up here is uh, what is the church? Uh, for that matter what is religion? And um, the only real source, definitive source of what religion is seems to be the IRS. I find that very curious. But uh, there are many, many religions or so-called religions in the world today. And it seems only that you have to just say this is a religion and fill out the forms and you are a uh, religion. Uh, we as Christians uh, look at it a little bit differently. Uh, we do recognize other religions around uh, the world, whether it's Buddhism, Shintoism, uh, Sikhism, uh, there are so many uh, what I would call bona fide religions, uh, but for the matter of our study, we're going to be looking at Christianity. And of course, uh, what comes up is, uh, as soon as we talk about Christianity, we talk about the church. And uh, for the matter of our discussion, uh, the church 
uh, and we mentioned this, I mentioned this last week, uh, is the church the people or is it is the building? And of course, the resounding answer was, it's the people. It is the people. Uh, if you look down at your uh, handout, uh, down there in Roman numeral 2, uh, what we find when we look at uh, the church, uh, there's the time period, what is the church? Uh, the word church uh, comes from the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia. Uh, now, if, if we go back into the Old Testament uh, uh, and look at one of the early books written, uh, Ecclesiastes, now, isn't that kind of curious that there's an Old Testament book in our Bible that's actually titled after a Greek word, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesia. Uh, Ecclesia in, the, uh, in Greek, in the Koine Greek, Koine Greek being common Greek, uh, means those gathered together, those gathered together, or the assembly, the assembly. So you can see that when we talk about ecclesia, the church, we're talking about all of us gathered together. That's who we are. We are those gathered together uh, by God. Now, if you look down at your handout down there, uh, the German transliteration, and that's when you can't match exact letters in translating word from word. Uh, it, it actually becomes kirka, kirka. Uh, and if you know somebody that knows German, they would tell you that kirka means church. Uh, early English, it's chircha. You can see how, now, uh, you've all heard the term Anglo-Saxons. Well, the Angles and the Saxons were two tribes of uh, Germanic people that lived in northern Germany, and at a certain point they came across the English Channel and populated England. In doing that, the Angles and the Saxons brought their language with them. And that's why a, a preponderance of English words actually have Germanic roots to them. And this is one. So it's Kirka to Chircha, and then we, of course, morph that right into uh, church itself. But as we look at those words, uh, as much as we know that that means the assembled you know, believers, we also look at it as belonging to God. The people in the church are those belonging to uh, God. Uh, the bottom line, and back to uh, Ecclesia, uh, for the purposes of the Lord, it means to assemble together in, in one location. And that's where we are uh, today uh, in the church. Uh, a term, the church visible and invisible. Uh, the church visible is this structure, it's us. But then the church is also an, an invisible uh, group. Uh, it's an invisible, a uh, visible, invisible uh, um, gathering of people. Uh, it's not only, as it said in Hebrews, therefore, since we are surrounded by other believers that have gone before us. So there are a lot of meanings when we look at the church. It's visible, but it's also invisible. Uh, when was the church established? Uh, look down at your handout down there in uh, Roman numeral 3. When was the church established? Uh, there are several different positions uh, that are held by scholars, uh, church people, as to when the actual church uh, or Christianity started. Uh, the first one, whoop, a little bit too far there, okay, Matthew 16, uh, verses 16 through 18, uh, and if you recall quickly, that is when Jesus said to Peter, and upon this rock, you remember that? Upon this rock. Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility that people look at is Matthew 28, uh, the, the resurrection of Christ. Is that when the church started? Or uh, in uh, Matthew 3, 13, 16, and 17, uh, upon the calling of the disciples, though that those that kind of went out, the apostles, the messengers, as that would be, uh, to actually uh, gather the people together 
and establish the church. And then uh, last possibility is Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, I would just kind of, if you want to shout out which you think it is, one, two, three, or four, give me a number. Yes, and that is the resounding, and that is the uh, position that probably 99% of Protestant Christians, and I use that word Protestant, we'll be looking at that term on down the road. Uh, if you take the position of uh, uh, Matthew 16, 16 through 18, and upon this rock, uh, that is a position taken by the church in Rome because they believe that Peter was the first pope, that he established the church, and that upon this rock, upon you, Peter. But that's a misunderstanding of the Greek that's used in that passage. I don't want to argue with my brothers and sisters in the uh, church in Rome, but uh, a better translation is, upon your faith, Peter. Upon your faith, Peter, I am establishing the church because we are a people of faith. We are a people of faith. Our church is based upon uh, our faith and belief who Jesus Christ is. All right, the Christian church growing. Uh, turn to uh, Acts 9, if you have your Bibles handy. And in Acts 9, we feel, see one of the uh, initial indications that the church was growing. And in Acts 9, verses uh, 1 through 2, here's what we have. Um, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Understand here that when they talk about disciples, they're talking about others beyond the apostles. They're more than likely they're talking about the apostles, plus other disciples that are out there that are adherents to Jesus Christ and his movement at this time. Uh, they went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And of course, here's, here's Saul prior to becoming Paul now, getting warrants for the arrest of these people called the way. Uh, and then we move on from that point, okay, uh, in Acts 11, if you turn over to Acts 11:26, 26, in Acts 11:26, 26, uh, and here they are there in Antioch, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came about that for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Christians at Antioch. So now uh, we see they are, so to speak, uh, partisans. They're partisans uh, of Jesus. And, and that word partisans means those that adhere or follow an individual. And, and we've seen that term used uh, around the world occasionally, partisans of a particular movement or partisans of a particular person. Now, initially, Christians, or those of the way, were looked upon as uh, being just another subsect of Judaism. Now, as we look back at Judaism uh, at this time in history, both in the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then moving into this first century period, post-33, Christians were looked at as just another group, uh, another splinter group of, Christ, uh, of Judaism. You had, we've all heard of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and many of you have heard of the Essenes. That was another subgroup of Jews. Uh, the Essenes were well known uh, for the discovery at Qumran. Uh, most, most people refer to those as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were the Essenes. Uh, there was also the Hasidim. The Hasidim. Those were all groups, subsects of Judaism. So, as this new person, Jesus Christ, who they in many ways looked at as just a, a prophet, a well learned uh, rabbi, it was just a subsect, another subsect of Judaism. 
And, and that kind of leads me to uh, have you understand that early on in the church uh, or in Christianity, they actually met in synagogues. Early on, they met in synagogues. Didn't last very long, but they did meet in synagogues. So we have this uh, uh, transition now. And of course, uh, where did they meet? Well, as I said, synagogues. Uh, where else have you heard historically that the Christians, particularly in Rome, met? Homes, right? Catacombs? Catacombs. The catacombs were actually uh, burial areas underneath Rome. Uh, it was an area that wasn't transited by officials uh, of the government uh, that were anti-Christian at that time. So that was a great place. So homes, the catacombs, uh, they met in some businesses, people that had small businesses. And, and this is really when you didn't have, as we have today, Mega churches. Uh, Carol and I, uh, some years back, uh, probably in the 90s, uh, we were living in Orlando, Florida, and uh, we were members at First Baptist Orlando. Uh, they had membership of 14,000 people. 14,000 people. They had a, uh, an inside uh, auditorium that I believe uh, held somewhere around 5,000 people. Do you think I got to know everybody in the congregation? Not hardly. Uh, our, the Bible study that I taught then had 80 people in it. That was kind of like the church within the church that knew each other. Uh, you go into the sanctuary and, you know, you, you just didn't know everybody that was there. So, yeah, there were a lot of different uh, locations that they would meet, uh, businesses, uh, it was pretty clear that between the uh, years 34 and 100 that there were still some uh, Christians that were meeting in synagogues. And, and of course, uh, uh, Jews Jew, of Judaism, uh, what is their day of worship? Saturday, Saturday. Uh, I think everybody uh, was glued to the TV when you saw the incident in Texas this past week. Uh, they were uh, worshiping on Shabbat or Sabbat, or the Sabbath. That was their standard uh, uh, worship uh, time. Uh, but these Christians would probably drift in and uh, come together on Sunday, the reason being that that was Resurrection Day. That was Resurrection Day. So, uh, now, uh, later on we'll find, as uh, we get a little bit further into uh, history, uh, that uh, Christians started uh, meeting in other locations. They started uh, meeting in basilicas, basilicas. Uh, they also uh, met in cathedrals. And uh, later on, uh, several weeks down the road, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between uh, basilicas and uh, cathedrals and where those names came from. We'll, we'll look at some of the architecture as it moved on. But at this time, small groups. It was small groups. And in most cases, uh, they were doing it uh, in secrecy. Okay, let's move on. Uh, if we uh, look at this particular picture here, and let me see if I can... Oh, my, my pointer isn't working. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, this is modern-day Turkey, okay? And uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea down here. And this little area right down in here is also part of Turkey that kind of comes down in here. This is modern-day Syria, okay? And where is Antioch? Antioch is right there, right in the middle of that little piece that comes down out of Turkey. And so this was one of the areas that was being uh, greatly enhanced by the Christian uh, movement. Uh, now, I want you to write something down on your handout, uh, and it's Aleppo, A-L-E-P-P-O, A-L-E-P-P-O, Aleppo. Now, some of you have heard of Aleppo. Uh, Aleppo is in Syria, right down in this area down here. Uh, the reason I mention that is it's going to come up in our discussion when we talk about the formulation of the Old and New Testament. 
Uh, Aleppo is a city that uh, probably about four or five years ago uh, during the uh, uh, Syrian uh, war, internal uh, war that they had, that uh, Aleppo, which was the second largest city in Syria, was almost totally destroyed, okay? But just keep that down there, and uh, uh, some of you that want to get ahead, uh, Google Aleppo, and, and you'll see that it has great Christian ties when it comes to the documentation and formulation of the, uh, the Old Testament, okay? And uh, this is actually what Antioch looks like today. Uh, and uh, if you would look at pictures of uh, current uh, Corinth, uh, Antioch, any of the cities in Turkey that were um, fairly large um, cities at this time during the first century, uh, even Ephesus, which is right on the uh, west coast of what's modern-day Turkey, uh, you'll find that most of them are like this. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, in the 5th, 6th, and 7th century, there were massive earthquakes uh, documented uh, in the area of what we call Turkey or Asia Minor, and uh, they decimated the, many of these cities, uh, and uh, they were left in ruins, and the people left. Uh, towns like Ephesus uh, had uh, suffered from earthquakes, plus Ephesus was a town that had a river flowing down through it into the uh, sea, and what happened was uh, early on it was a great seaport, large ships would come in, a lot of trading, but then what happened was the uh, harbor filled up with silt and the ships could no longer come in there and so the city died. Some interesting history that comes out of, uh, of these cities. Okay, let's uh, move on to the uh, church and uh, persecution. Um, if you look down at your handout, uh, the persecution of Christians starts on or about the time of, of Nero uh, in 64. And uh, we've all heard that, you know, story historically. Uh, Rome burned and Nero fiddled. Okay, we, we've all heard that. Well, the story behind that being a great uh, emphasis for or motivation for uh, persecuting Christians is that uh, a fire did start in Rome. Uh, Two-thirds of the city was burned down. And if you were going to guess... What part of the city, section of the city, did not burn down? Who were the people that were living there? Christians. Uh, the, it seems like the Christian section of town was spared in Rome with this great fire that engulfed uh, the whole city. And, of course, uh, that was uh, uh, an alleged reason why uh, they uh, perpetrated, the Christians had perpetrated this fire, started this fire. Of course, there's, there's nothing that would suggest that at, at all. Now, as we, as we move on, okay, uh, we ask the question, how were Christians uh, initially treated by the Jews? Uh, well, they were treated horribly. Uh, they were alienated by them. Uh, they typically wouldn't want to do business with them. Uh, they ridiculed them, and so it was very tough, and uh, uh, that was just life at, at that particular time. Uh, so it does begin with Nero and goes through uh, uh, ten emperors. Uh, raise of hands, how many of you have seen the movie The Gladiator? Okay, that uh, was a well-known movie. Uh, one of the characters that was mentioned in the movie was Marcus Aurelius. You remember he came on early on in the show and then he, he kind of he died. Well, it was during Marcus Aurelius's reign that the persecution of Christians really started in earnest and then moved on through uh, several other uh, emperors. And, and they had various reasons uh, for uh, persecuting uh, Christians. Uh, of course, Christians uh, aligned themselves with God through Jesus Christ and that the Lord God was God. And, but in Rome, Caesar, the emperor, was God. So there was this conflict, and uh, the uh, Roman emperor at the time, whoever it might have been, 
uh, Vespasian, uh, Diocletian. There was a whole list of them up until we find Constantine coming on the scene uh, in the beginning of the 4th century that persecuted Christians. And uh, these Christians were persecuted because, number one, they wouldn't align, they wouldn't disavow God or Christ and claim Caesar as, as God. That was, that was one. Uh, two, they were persecuted because they closed their businesses on Sundays. And so they were seen as anti-mercantile. They were anti-business. Uh, they were also, and, and I, I find this really uh, interesting, um, have any of you belonged to a church where at the beginning of the service uh, they would say, well, welcome to Stuart Heights Baptist Church. Everybody please stand up and greet one another. Sure, you know, we've done that over the years. Uh, and uh, in some uh, more liturgical churches, uh, like Lutheran and Catholic and Episcopal and so on and so forth, they would actually stand up and, you know, they'd give each other hugs or they would give what's called the kiss of peace. And in the early church, Christians, they would all get together and they would just kind of kiss each other on cheek. So when first time I went to Europe, that, I, I found that was very typical, that you know people greeting each other that know each other would kiss each other on both the cheeks. Okay, uh, the friendship shake, uh, the, the, the greeting of Christians amongst each other. Well, what the Romans uh, purported this activity as indicative of homosexuality. Okay? Go figure. But they were looking for reasons uh, to persecute uh, the Christians at this particular time. And so those were some of the reasons uh, that they persecuted them. Uh, and the question comes up when, uh, let me move this slide ahead here, um, kind of parenthetically here, uh, there's a great book if you want to uh, go on Amazon or uh, go on some other site, uh, Fox's Martyrs. Uh, this author, Fox, uh, several uh, uh, centuries back, documented all of the deaths and tortures of uh, early Christians. And uh, he did a great job. It's a, a small little paperback that you could get it in. And uh, anyways, uh, I, I highly recommend that. But the question comes up, what were the types of um, persecutions? How did they actually, what were the charges? Uh, an, another one was what the Romans called cannibalism. They charged Christians with cannibalism. Now, why would you think that they could or would charge Christians with cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, the, what we call the Lord's Supper, uh, or uh, what uh, uh, the, the church in Rome uh, calls the Eucharist, giving thanks, uh, the Eucharist giving thanks, where when you take the bread and put it in your mouth, according to Roman Catholics and, and other uh, denominations, that literally becomes what? The body of Christ, literally. And, and when you take the cup at that time of wine and drink it, that literally becomes what? The blood of Christ. And so uh, some early Christian groups were following this, okay? And, and that act, there's, there's Scripture that... I believe is misinterpreted. Well, at least you take the the blood and the you know the the body of the Christ. You cannot be born again. Uh, I believe that's a misinterpretation, a mistranslation. Uh, but they said, "Oh, they're cannibals." Okay, that was another reason uh, that they used to uh, uh, persecute some of the Christians. Uh, the disruption of businesses. On, on Sunday. They just didn't open up. That was another one. Uh, many early Christians gave away their property and, so to speak, went into what was called self-imposed poverty. And so they saw this as just antisocial, uh, that these people were antisocial. Um, and, and sometimes the, uh, the emperor just disagreed with the philosophy. Um, now, we, we fast forward in time and uh, when you look at uh, the church in Rome or the Roman Catholic Church, and I don't know whether I mentioned, I think I mentioned this last week, that that term Roman Catholic Church really comes from originally the church in the West, then they were the church in Rome, and then they became the Roman Catholic Church, 
Catholic in Latin means universal. So it's the universal church in, in Rome. Uh, but uh, that, that being said, uh, the, the Roman emperor often just philosophically uh, disagreed with them. Uh, and this went on for uh, literally uh, centuries. Uh, look down at your handout. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, early church uh, worship. Uh, and by the way, this is a, a picture uh, out of uh, Fox's Martyrs. Uh, the, the first documented female Christian martyr uh, was a young lady named Blandina. And in your handout, uh, the final page, you should have uh, this same, same slide. And as the story goes, uh, Blandina was a new Christian. She was living in Gaul, which we know today is France. And uh, that's, that was part of the Roman Empire at that point. And this is actually uh, kind of mid-second century, so we're jumping ahead here. But uh, uh, the Roman officials were asking people, demanding people that they recant their belief in God through Jesus Christ. And uh, Blandina was one that said no. And so they uh, you know, whipped her, they beat her, so on and so forth. She still wouldn't recant. Uh, many of her friends says, please recant, recant. And uh, eventually what they did, as uh, Fox uh, details it, uh, they put her in kind of like a mesh basket, okay, and rolled her out, and then she was gored to death uh, by uh, bulls, horned bulls. And that was just one way uh, that they uh, tortured and martyred p uh, people, Christians. Uh, they also would put people in... Uh, uh, Christians in uh, metal chairs and then start fires and just cook them uh, in the, uh, the chairs. Uh, but the uh, way Christians have been treated, and we'll see in the centuries ahead, the way Christians have treated other Christians is in many ways very despicable. But we'll, we'll get to that uh, later. Okay, uh, and there was uh, the Colosseum where she was uh, actually uh, martyred in uh, Gaul. Okay, Early church worship. Um, I started out our session uh, this evening uh, by looking at a passage uh, in Colossians. Uh, and in that particular passage in Colossians, it talks about singing psalms, singing, playing music, uh, praises to the Lord. Uh, and this is just one of the forms uh, of singing psalms in the early church service. And as we look at the next couple of slides, I would ask you the question, kind of the rhetorical question, you don't have to answer this. Uh, are there any things that we do during our worship services today that do not come out of Scripture? Think about that for a second. Are there any things that we do in worship today that do not come directly out of Scripture? Well, yeah, there are. But here's the question, are they worshipful? And the answer is yes, uh, they are. Okay? And, and, and think about that word worship, because we're here, number one, to exalt the Savior, worship the Savior. That word worship comes from an old English word which means worth-ship, worth-ship. And so when we come in to worship Almighty God, we come in here to show His value, His worth, reverence to Him, honoring Him. And we can do that through a variety of different ways, whether it might be responsive readings, whether it uh, might be playing organ music, uh, uh, whether it might be singing a modern song. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, divisions in churches today about music. Anybody, you know, you know, yeah, uh, and, and how loud it is, and, you know, whether it's a, a bit uh, raucous, so on and so forth. And I have to tell you, my mother was the church organist, and I love organ music. I love high church organ music. But then on the other hand, I'm also a drummer, and I've played in a lot of praise bands, and I've had uh, senior adults come up to me and say, Phil, sometimes you're loud. 
up there. And, I, and my response is, well, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit just gets a hold of me and I just got to crash one of those, those symbols up there. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that we do in church that uh, may not be scriptural, but they're worshipful. And when we come in here, we have to come into this center or wherever we're worshiping with a worshipful attitude, one of reverence, honoring God, respecting God, understanding who God is in relationship to who we are. Okay. Um, Often, and we see this in Scripture, there would be prayers for others that were there, that were not there, that were in need, something that we did earlier uh, this evening, uh, followed by amen. And amen is just an ancient word which means I agree or we agree with that. Amen. Uh, Typically in the early church, there would be a benevolence giving for the poor and the needy. And, and we see this in Acts 6, uh, chapter 1, uh, where it seemed that there was a, an understanding that many of the members, uh, primarily widows and older people, were being neglected, that they weren't being cared for. And this is something that uh, we struggle with today. Uh, I know is that I have moved from my uh, 50s into my 60s and into my 70s. Uh, sometimes I think young people kind of look at Carol and I and say, Aren't they a cute couple? <laughs> yeah, but you know that just comes comes with the territory, okay? Uh, but as as a as a pastor, uh, I would uh, stand up before a congregation to do a memorial or a, a funeral. But prior to that, I would have sat down with the individual that had passed, or I would sit down with their family, and I would find out what a rich history these cute little people had. You know, and we just don't take care of our senior adults like we should. And that's when y'all say, Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. We got that. All right. So that's something that they did. Um, The Supper. Uh, Turn in your Bibles to uh, chapter 2 in Acts, if you have your Bibles handy, and 246. in verse 46, and day by day, continuing with one mind, oh my gosh, these people in the the early church were thinking alike. It's an interesting concept. Uh, In the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity in heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. It, It really sounded very communal. I mean, they were just getting together, having a great time. Now, the question comes up uh, from an exegetical point. Uh, when they talked about breaking bread and, and having a meal, uh, there's really two positions on this. Uh, one is that they were actually uh, performing an early position on the Lord's Supper. You know, uh, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, you know. Uh, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is my body that was broken for you, that they were doing that. The other position, and I think it has uh, some validity, is that they were actually having koinonia meals, fellowship meals. Uh, They would meet together, and they would worship, and they would just uh, be loving each other and caring for each other, and and then they would go someplace, and they would have a meal. They would bring food. And, and have just a, a kind of a feast, you know, kind of like the, the feast we're all expecting uh, in heaven. So those are kind of two positions that we come out of, uh, out of that particular passage. Um, and there was also the preaching and or proclaiming of the word. Um, and there are, and we can talk about this in the weeks to come, uh, there are probably five different uh, Greek words that we use as either preaching or evangelism or spreading the gospel. And each one has a different flavor to it, uh, whether it's standing on a street corner, uh, whether it's uh, proclaiming God's word, just different, different styles of, of sharing uh, the word. But I've got a question there. So did they preach the word from the Bible? Well, if you're talking about the Old Testament, probably so. There were probably readings out of the Old Testament. 
probably at this particular time, uh, between uh, 33 and 100, um, you probably had a couple of Paul's letters that were out there circulating around, and maybe one or two of the other disciples' uh, letters uh, that were circulating around or had been written to a particular church. Uh, So uh, preaching strictly from what we call the New Testament probably wasn't happening uh, at this particular time in history. But yes, uh, they they were using the Old Testament. And if you remember last week, Jews today call the old what we call the old testament the tanakh the tanakh okay so yeah they were probably using that and it probably wouldn't be until the mm, end of the second century into the third century that more of these letters were being shared between the churches copies were being made and uh, being shared and then read aloud in 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 church at that particular time, and we'll talk uh, more about that uh, in the future, okay? All right, Uh, as we get to the uh, end of uh, probably the first century, uh, you can see that Christianity was starting to spread, and uh, if we, uh, here's one area right here, uh, just off the coast of uh, what we know as uh, Italy, Italia, uh, and that r- city right there was uh, Corinth, uh, or I'm sorry, Carthage. That was Carthage on the, the north rim of uh, Africa. And uh, a question came up last week uh, about uh, the codification or development of the uh, New Testament. And it was in Carthage in 397 that the church at large, with all the, the leaders of the churches, voted and codified what we now call the New Testament. So you can see very quickly uh, the spread of Christianity all the way up into this was Gaul, uh, Germania up into here. Uh, This is modern day Belgium up in here. Uh, But uh, over here in what we call Asia Minor or uh, Turkey, you can see right along the rim here, uh, you have, of course, uh, Antioch uh, down here. Uh, You have Ephesus Uh, You have uh, Philippi over here, uh, Athens, uh, Alexandria over here, uh, which was a large Christian population. Uh, So Christianity during the first century uh, was starting to grow. Uh, The phenomenon that that, that just really kind of amazes me is uh, the more persecution that was being meted out against Christians, the more it grew. The more it grew. Uh, and, of course, uh, as we move forward into the, the, the 6th and 7th century, uh, then what we find is the, uh, the beginning of uh, Islam uh, down in this area, down in here, uh, and eventually uh, during uh, the uh, uh, pre-Crusades and so on and so forth, you find their movement taking over uh, in that area in Asia Minor. So a lot of... Uh, a lot of things that were going on here in the first century, but it was growing, uh, no doubt. All right, let's uh, talk about uh, what we're going to do uh, next week. This is just the beginning, uh, kind of the nucleus uh, of the church, but next week what I want you to do, and this is your homework assignment, okay, and this will take you maybe five minutes to read Acts 28 verses 1 through 31. That closes out the book of Acts. Uh, But what I want you to do is I want you to answer the question, what did Paul do, first of all, while he was in confinement, which we see kind of towards the the end of Acts? Think about that, what he did when he was in confinement. And what does Scripture tell us about what ultimately happened to Paul? We briefly mentioned that uh, last week. Uh, And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and what uh, Paul did and what we know about him and uh, kind of go from there. Um, with that, uh, this is probably the, the shortest class we're going to have uh, in all of the sessions, but uh, now that I can get out of the light. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, what are your questions for this evening? Do you have any questions? Any thoughts? Somebody's got a question back there. 
way in the back. <laughs> Questions? No? Yes? Uh-huh. Some people I've heard equate that with Rome. It's like a code word for Rome. Uh, is there any real evidence that Peter ever actually went to Rome? Or was it just when he talks about Babylon? Is he talking about Babylon? Uh, the, the question Phil is, is asking is about when uh, Peter talks about uh, Babylon. And uh, Many of the positions, particularly when you relate that to the book of Revelation, does anybody know of any different positions on the, uh, the book of Revelation? Are there any different positions on the book? Of, yeah, just, just, just a few. Uh, and, and, and many uh, biblical scholars uh, can relate those comments or other comments uh, to what was happening prior to that or just after that or off into the future. I mean, there are those, that diversity of positions. Um, you know, and, and let me kind of answer your question, Phil, from a kind of a different direction. Uh, when it comes to uh, Peter and Paul and Mary, no, no, not Mary. Uh, <laughs> different, different time zone. Um, uh, there are different um, legends as to what actually happened to them. Uh, whether one of the uh, apostles made it to India. You know, many of us have heard that. Um, and, and it's really hard to kind of ferret through that. Now, one of the reasons that I wanted to give you this assignment uh, next week was to see if there's any clarity in your minds as to what happened to Paul. Because I was just uh, uh, reading a well very well written book, uh, Atlas, that many of us use, uh, and there was a timeline in it, and it actually marked the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in Rome. Well, let's, let's read this and then see what we know and what we don't know and what makes sense and what really helps us better understand who Jesus Christ is. Now, understand and here's, here's an important phrase that we'll look at in, in the weeks to come. What is the Bible? What is the Bible to you? Well, the Bible is the historical documentation of the, 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 the sin of man and God's redemption of humanity. It's the historical documentation of man's sin and God's redemption of humanity. Think about it. God created Humanity sinned, and then the whole rest of the Bible is about God reaching back into humanity to draw it back to Him. Okay, Now, if you think about that context, when you're reading a passage, and I know all of you are reading through the Bible every year, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> this is yes, this is <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I read the Bible. Okay. You'll come across a passage, and you'll go like, what is that talking about? Or what does that have to do with, you know, you know, making peanut butter cookies? Um, but if you, if you frame it in terms of it's the historical do documentation of God's redemption of humanity, then it kind of brings it into, you know, a narrow scope because uh, there is zoology in the Bible, there is biology in the Bible, there is just straight history in the Bible, but the larger picture... So, uh, but we'll, we'll look at some of those legends as we go on because uh, uh, next week and the week after, we'll be looking at the apostolic era. It's when the apostles, uh, apostolos, which means messengers, okay, what they were doing. And then we'll move into what's called the post apostolic period, which were the apostles mentored and discipled new people. And then they carried the message. And we'll look at that lineage out there, which really essentially brings us kind of into today uh, eventually. So, but that's a good question. Is that a nice rabbit hole to go down? Okay. All right. I have a question. Yes. Just in case you're pulling something on us. Why is there a storm coming 
Ah, I was wondering. <laughs> I just did anybody see the spam can up there? Okay, well, what did Paul say about what you can eat? All things. <laughs> no, all things. Any spam fans in here? Raise your hand if you. Okay, all right, I just want to find out who my friends are. Okay, all right. Spam and egg, spam and mac, spam cold. You, you see, now, yeah, I'll close with this thought. Now, the last time most of you ate spam, okay, it was the twist off top, right? Ah, I see, spam has changed since then, okay? No more twist off, it, it's a pop top, okay? Now, in the old days with the twist off, you remember they had all that gel and fat in there? You remember that? Ugh, that was terrible. No more. That's not in a can of spam. Spam now is 100% meat byproduct. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> My wife is laughing back there because a couple of years ago, our, our granddaughter was living with us while she was going to college in Florida. And uh, both of them were like, oh, spam, ah, like that. Well, I snuck it in on them one night, you know, with some nice, you know, seasoned uh, uh, black-eyed peas and, and uh, rice and everything like that. And, oh, they were just eating it up and everything. Well, that was good, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was really good, Grandpa. What was that? Broke the news. You know, they both ran to the bathroom. <laughs> no, no, they didn't do that. <laughs> All right. All right. If no more questions, I'll be hanging around here for just a little bit. But uh, uh, from the sixth chapter of uh, Numbers for a benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord also grant you graciousness and his love. Amen. Good night.